But we do have evidence, though, that points in the trajectory of understanding that Mary was protected from sin throughout her entire life. And very early evidence, we have the ascension of Isaiah and the Odes of Solomon, early Christian documents from the first century that describe Mary having a pain-free childbirth. And if you remember in Genesis chapter 3, one of the curses of original sin is pain in childbirth. So if someone is spared from the pain of childbirth, it would naturally follow that they were spared from the curse of original sin. Likewise, the church fathers, uh, Irenaeus is one of them. Notice what is uh, here. The ascension of Isaiah, the odes of Solomon attest to Mary's pain-free birth. Now, I really, I really, 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 really wonder, um, do Catholic apologists, I've got the echo coming back again, uh, do Catholic apologists really want to go here? Do they really, <sighs> I mean, if, 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 if they know the nature of these sources, if they know what they say, if, if, if they know their background, if they know out, out of what they're coming, do you really want to stand there in front of your audience and say to them, go look at this stuff. Go look at this material. Because there's going to be a lot of them that are going to go, wait a minute, th this material is plainly ahistorical? Well, but, 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 but it's an indication. Okay, but it's an indication. It comes from what? Why, why would these sources... Um, say this? Why would these sources want to say that Mary had a pain-free birth? Well, because Jesus didn't really have a physical body. Because they're Gnostic, they're dualistic. So that's not what Rome down the road is trying to do in regards to Mary and perpetual virginity and immaculate conception and all the rest of this kind of stuff. Um, the whole complex and eventually bodily assumption. Stuff, bodily assumption, unknown in the early church. Just, just plain unknown. And the first times it shows up, it's in stuff that the Pope says is heretical. He didn't say that that was heretical. He said that the work itself was heretical, which is hardly a high endorsement or something. But the point is, this is, this is plainly not the faith of the early church. But if you're a Roman Catholic, you've been told that it is, and therefore you have to believe it. I just, I don't understand. You know, when I, when we look at Gregory, okay? We've been looking at Gregory's confession of faith. Have I not over and over again said, you need to let the early church fathers be the early church fathers. You, let, you need to let them be who they were when they lived. So you can ask questions of them that they never respond. They, it, it's unfair. They never even talked about it. It wasn't even an issue in their day. So don't try to drag them in. And there seems to be a lot of folks who, who have the idea that if you find a great deal of benefit in what Gregory said about his, his confession of faith as to who Jesus was. That must mean you agree with everything Gregory said. No. That is a childish way of dealing with historical sources. It's infantile. I see it all the time, but it's infantile. You have to get to the point of maturity to be able to go, I can look at what this person said and I can gain great benefit from this person's work in this area. Over here, I think that his conclusions in this subject are erroneous. It's possible that he had not, he was unaware of this fact and this fact and this fact from New Testament uh, studies and things like that that hadn't been done in his day or whatever else. But you have to be able to take the good and the bad. For a lot of people, no. 
if you find someone who's orthodox on this subject, then everything you... The problem is that creates massive contradiction. Massive contradiction. You're, you're going to find almost no two early church fathers that agreed on every single thing. And so anyone who deals with the, the church fathers in a meaningful fashion has to allow that level of freedom in analysis of what they're saying. And so um, notice uh, this, this statement here as well. Uh, church fathers compare Mary to Eve who was also without sin. Now think about that for a second. Church fathers compare Mary to Eve who was also without sin. Well, she wasn't without sin her whole life, was she? Um, Eve fell, didn't she? Eve was deceived, wasn't she? As soon as you start doing the parallel equals identity stuff, it falls apart. And I've told the story many times of going out on the bike ride when I was listening to Jerry Matitix run through this list of alleged parallels between Mary and, and Eve and between uh, uh, Mary and the, the Ark of the Covenant. And I mean, it sounded so good when you don't have a Bible in front of you. And it's just being thrown out, rat a tat tat, rat a tat tat, rat a tat tat. It just boom, 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 boom. Sounds so good. Until I got back, got cleaned up, sat down in front of an old, oh, I'm not sure if it was even a Pentium back then. It might have been. Um, and started, you know, took, put the cassette tape, start, stop, look it up. Start, stop, look it up. Every single one was flawed. Every, it was either just completely wrong information or obvious problems or something that was missed that creates a, a new parallel that would demonstrate something about Mary you don't want to prove about Mary. So you, you have to take the time to listen carefully and to analyze. And when you do, wow. Um, and, and then I don't know why this is doing it this way. Oh, that, that ain't going to help. So you've got Ephraim the Syrian, the Nisabine hymns, there is no flaw in thee and no stain in thy mother. Um, so what you want to, what you, what they're trying to do with something like that is, oh, see, there is no stain in thy, mo mo thy mother. Therefore, she was immaculately conceived and she was sinless in her life. Well, maybe someone by then had dreamt up something like that, but maybe not. I mean, utilizing flowery language of people, you know, I, I mean, today someone says of, uh, well, the NBA finals, I guess, are going on right now. I wish I could be excited about them. I live in Phoenix and I was here in 93 and it was exciting in 93 because, you know, the NBA wasn't run by the Chinese Communist Party in 93, so you could actually get excited about things. But it is now, so I could really care less. But uh, it's like someone saying such and such a player, because I, I know the name of one player on the Suns. <laughs> Chris Paul, I think. Okay, I, I've heard yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not even sure know where, I, where I know him from, but Chris Paul. Uh, that's the only person I know. Sorry. That's sad. Uh, but remember Charles and Kevin Johnson and Dan Marley? Yeah, that was a different, different time. Anyway, that'd be like saying Chris Paul had a perfect game. Well, wait a minute. Um, actually, he had a turnover. Uh, he missed 35% um, of his shots. Uh, he missed two free throws. Um, it wasn't actually perfect. And the person I go, well, Duh, I know that that's not what a perfect game means. I was saying is he was dominant. He, he came through in the clutch. Da, 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 da. But as long as you want to, as long as you have a context that you're willing to import into the words, then, ah, here was someone who was claiming that Chris Paul hit every shot and never missed one. And 
uh, never had a foul. And no, that's not what they were saying, was it? No, because this kind of exalted language, very, very common. Um, very, very common indeed. So anyways, this is how you mess with church history. And you read things into church history that just, just weren't there to begin with. 